our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. That quote from Martin Luther King Jr. really stuck with me this past week as I saw the continued reports of the Syrian refugee crisis. I'm personally ashamed it's taken me this long uh, for this crisis to grab my attention. The Syrian refugee crisis, you may or may not know, is the largest refugee crisis since World War II. Men and women and children are fleeing their war-torn country. And in Syria, there's also uh, been seen, see, uh, seen a rise in the militant terror, terrorist group ISIS. Families are choosing the dangerous path through uh, the open sea, and many perish in their escape. I've seen reports of between 7 and 11 million people have been displaced. Half of them are under the age of 18. In many situations, these refugees have been exploited by smugglers. They have faced violence even after they have escaped their country, and they have been turned away by entire governments. Some have been compassionately welcomed by others. Most notably, the German government has been extraordinary. Our government this week just announced that we would receive 10,000 families starting October the 1st. We may not know or we may know how to effectively respond when we see images like this but when we see them we do know one thing we do know that something is wrong fundamentally at the core of our beings we do know something is wrong and something needs to be made right Today we began a new message series called Simply Christian, Why Christianity Makes Sense. And in this series, we're going to take a look at four longings of the human heart and how God has met these longings most fully in Jesus. And today we look at the longing for justice. N.T. Wright, the author of the book Simply Christian that inspired this series and has helped shape my thinking on this topic, wrote, a sense of justice comes with the kit of being human. I mean, think about it for a moment. If you lined up 10 four-year-olds across the front of this room and you gave seven of them a piece of candy, the other three are going to say, hey, that's just not right. Or we see the victims of sex trafficking, many being young teenage girls, being trapped in a seething world of exploitation, being treated like property. And we hear about this and we see something like this and we say, hey, something is just not right. We see victims of police brutality and we see some police being victims of senseless violence. And we say, hey, that's just not right. We see refugee families losing their children at sea as they flee for their lives. We see images of a two-year-old washed up on the shore. And we say, hey, that's just not right. There's something about being human that looks at injustice. And we know that it's just not right. The word justice almost always brings to mind a sense that something has been done wrong and it needs to be evaluated. It needs to be judged and then it must be made right. And this is one definition of justice, but the Bible also expands the definition of justice. And in the Bible, it has a broader meaning. It also means the standard by which the needs and advantages of community life are distributed. And this would include material goods, right of participation, opportunities, and liberties. And when you do something, for example, to help the poor, we may call this an act of compassion or an act of mercy or an act of charity. The Bible would often call an act of mercy or an act of justice. In the Bible, there's an entire book, the book of Amos, that has justice as the theme. Amos was written in the 8th century, and it was written at a time when Israel was just flush. They had picked up, their economy was really, really good, and the trade routes had gotten very lucrative. And what was happening in Israel at the time that Amos wrote, what was happening is the wealthy were getting even wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, and the poor were being exploited. 
And so God sends Amos to the nation of Israel. And then we just see incredible passages about justice in the book. For example, Amos writes, They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. There are those who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. And then perhaps one of the most famous quotes from Amos, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. A sense of justice just comes with the kit of being human. We want things to be made right when they're wrong. We want them to. But it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, we could take a car and get it fixed. We can renovate a home and get it fixed and repaired. A surgeon can give us new hips and knees and heaven knows what else, but we can't seem to fix injustice. I mean, look at the newspaper. Look at our world. Well, if you're new to downtown like I am, let me tell you something about this congregation. I have already learned quickly since I have been talking with the congregation before I got here and since I've been here that this congregation has a heart. That this congregation is literally, physically in the heart of Old Town. And I believe this congregation has the potential to be the heart of Old Town and beyond. We know that we need to reach out to the lost and the least of these. We know that. And we have a heart and desire for people to be brought into a sense of community and for people to experience a sense of justice and mercy and well-being. So the question for us this morning as we take a look at this one issue of justice is not should we do justice. That's not the question for us today. The question is not for us should we be compassionate people. It is more of a qualitative question. How is we... How can we as God's people raise our justice-seeking, justice-doing to another level? How can we become even more aware, more courageous, more passionate, passionate about those on the margins? I believe we can find the answer to our text this morning as we look at one of the more provocative parables of our Lord. So if you will, turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and we'll be looking at verses 19 through 31. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. This parable, parable is also known as teaching stories, reads like this. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is God's word to you. Often when we read this parable, we raise questions on the nature of hell. And we see words like torment and fire and agony. And no, I'm not describing the national season. And again, we can learn some things about hell 
from this passage, although we always need to know that when the Bible speaks of hell, it speaks of hell in a very symbolic and image driven language and there's a mystery to the exact nature of it we'll explore that topic maybe another time because our focus today is the focus of justice that is raised in this parable so let's just peel back the onion a little bit and just ask a couple of driving questions and the question that just screams out at this text from this text is why hell for the rich man and heaven for Lazarus I mean, that's the question that just screams from this parable. Why is the rich man in heaven, or hell, excuse me, and Lazarus, the poor beggar, in heaven? Was it because one man was rich and the other was poor? No. Being rich doesn't automatically send you to hell, and being poor doesn't automatically send you to heaven. Jesus does teach us that money can get in the way of us seeing our need for God. And Jesus does teach us that God has a special place in his heart for the poor. But you can be poor and really bitter and mean and have a heart closed to God. And you can be wealthy and have a heart that is redeemed and a heart that is shaped by God. So it wasn't because one was rich and one was poor. Was it because the rich man was really a mean person? Is that why he was in hell? No. Again, this is a story, but but we need to learn from it. There's nothing in this story that tells us the rich man was a mean man. I mean, let's look at what we know about him from the story. He wore purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Now, who wore purple back then? It was the uber-wealthy. And it was royalty. Fine linen means really nice undergarments. This man was the elite of the elite. And when you think about the super rich today, who comes to mind? I mean, you don't have to name anybody. Please don't name anybody. But there's several people that may come to mind. And I'm not going to judge any famous wealthy person here, but can you imagine a famous wealthy person allowing a beggar to live at the edge of their property right outside their gates. I mean, this man allowed the beggar at least to be there. I mean, look at him for a moment. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Again, this is a story. But Jesus is going into a lot of detail to describe Lazarus here. This man is covered with sores. These sores are oozing pus and dogs are licking them. He is ulcerated and he is emaciated and he is there by the gate. Now stay with me. If a beggar with oozing sores attracting wild dogs was camped out on the edge of your property, would you let them stay there? Would you? At least he's there. By the gate. The rich man is letting him at least be there by the gate. So he's not mean. And stay with me. If a beggar with oozing sores is staying there, and now we find he's eating scraps from the rich man's table. And the word Jesus uses for the word longing is epithemia, which is a word that describes a longing for something of which you have received a little bit, but you just can't get satisfied. So could it be, in this story by our Lord, could it even be that the rich man would send out the scraps to the beggar by the gate? Would you send out scraps to a beggar by your driveway? We don't feed stray cats because we're afraid they'll come back, do we? So the rich man in hell... Was it because he was a bad, mean man? We have no evidence of that in this story. So why is the rich man in hell? It's still the question on the table. Why is he? Our answer is found in the name. It's found in the name. This parable is stunning. 
as a parable because it is the only parable in which Jesus gave a fictitious character a name. Usually he uses names like woman or father or son or farmer or sower. But here, he gives the poor man a name. Lazarus. And what does this name Lazarus mean? It means God is my help. God is my help. You see, Lazarus, the poor man, turned to God in his poverty. And he recognized his need for help. And indeed, he recognized his need for God's mercy. And in the afterlife, he was delivered. He received mercy and compassion. But the other man is named too. He's just not given a proper name, is he? But he's named. He's named the rich man. He's named for what he relied on. He relied on his money during this life. He turned to his money during this life, this life to be his ultimate and to be his help. And ultimately, his money consumed him so much that all you had to do is call him the rich man. He ultimately lost his identity and he became known by what kept him from God. Let me say that again. He lost his identity and became known by what kept him from God. Whatever it is that keeps someone from God is ultimately what they will be known for. Hell is full of people named for what kept them from reaching out to God. This man never admitted that he needed God. So certainly if you don't recognize your need for God on earth, you will not have communion with God in heaven. So a question for us as we read this parable, who or what is your help? This man was named the rich man because the money was his help. Someone else would be named the career man because that's where they find their ultimate sense of being. Someone else would be named the family man, because that's where they find the ultimate sense of being. Someone else may be named the fitness man or the, the beauty person or the looks person because that's ultimately where their ladder is leaning. It's ultimately where they find their help. But Lazarus was named Lazarus because he said, God is my help. C.S. Lewis says there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those for whom God says, thy will. To whom God says, thy will be done. So this is the image of the rich man in the parable. So consumed by his wealth, he completely lost his identity and was only known by what consumed him. And that kind of hell starts right here on earth and carries all the way through eternity. I knew a guy who has since died, but I'll, I'll change his name to something clever, John Doe. And at first, it was John Doe has a complaint. Then it was, you know, John Doe, the complainer. And then he simply became known as the complaint. His complaining and his discontent in life took away his identity. This is what sin does. That's what turning to anything other than God does. Anything other than God for your help. So what does this have to do with raising our desire for justice? That's what I'm come, kind of come, going to come back around to. Making things right for those who are on the margins of life, like this beggar, like the Syrian refugees. What does this have to do with that idea of justice? Notice the rich man said to Jesus, send Lazarus to tell my five brothers and warn them. He was in hell and he was still treating Lazarus like a servant. He had the audacity to ask Jesus to send, to have Lazarus leave heaven. You see, he was still treating Lazarus like a servant instead of a brother. 
He was still treating Lazarus like a servant instead of a brother. When your heart is connected with God, when you have the vertical relationship in your life right, when you are squared up with God, then you recognize the hard truth that really injustice, the line between justice and injustice runs right through us. We each do wrong. And when you are fully in relationship with God, you recognize that there was a point in your life when you had to recognize your need for mercy, when you had to recognize that, yes, God, I am a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior and I cannot help myself. And when it comes to my salvation, I'm like a beggar by a gate. I cannot feed myself. I cannot help myself. But I want to turn to you and open my heart and my life to you. And I need to receive from you mercy. And when we realize just how much we have been helped by God, there's that word again, God is my help, and how our greatest need has been met by Jesus on the cross, the need that we cannot meet on our own, then your heart melts and it breaks for those who are on the margins like the beggar. And the beggar starts stops becoming the beggar and the beggar starts becoming your brother. You make the Lazaruses of this world not your servant to be beneath you, but your brother who stands in mercy just as we have all stood in mercy before the cross to receive the mercy of our Lord. Do you see that? Jesus wants us to see the poor and not just to write a check, although checks are used by God and checks are needed, but he wants you to weep for Lazarus as your brother like Jesus did. So when it comes to this idea of justice, the big question, who's your Lazarus? Who is the Lazarus in your life? For whom will you weep? Do you see those in your world who are on the margins? Do you weep for them? Do you desire for them? to know the Lord, do you desire for them to come in from the margins and into the life of the community, to come from the gate and to dine at the table of salvation? As Christians, we are called not to retreat to islands of indifference. We would look at hurting people like our brothers and like our sisters. Justice is the kit of being human. One political philosophy in our country would say, that we need government programs to do justice in our world today. Another political philosophy in our government would say, no, we need people to pull themselves by the bootstraps. And we need corporations and we need various other uh, free enterprise systems to help with the poor. There are limits to that. There are limits to the first one. What God's people see, we see people in need. And we say, God, what do I do? How do I see the person in need like my brother? I was moved by the story of Christopher Catromboni, a 33-year-old American millionaire. When he was 30, Bloomberg reported his net worth of being around $10 million. He had been in some sort of uh, uh, software. And in 2013, his family was on a luxury cruise in the Mediterranean, and they noticed a winter coat in the water. And... Christopher started asking the captain, you know, what's that winter coat about? What's going on? And then the captain said to them, it probably belonged to a refugee attempting to escape and cross the water and make it to Europe. This experience stayed with them, and they were also inspired by the words of Pope Francis on the refugee crisis and what Francis called the globalization of indifference. So they, they heard and they picked up that challenge. Well, Catramboni said to himself, he was convicted. The Lord used that coat to convict him. He said, we're up here taking this luxury cruise and yet there are people dying. So he and his wife did something about it. They invested $8 million, okay, that's 80% of their wealth, in setting up the migrant offshore aid station that was Europe's first privately funded rescue operation. They bought this boat and they focused on simply rescuing refugees in the Mediterranean. 
Much of the money was spent on the uh, rescue craft, the inflatable boats, and then drones to help them locate and find people. And according to their website, they have now to date rescued 10,000 people. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Kim Catramboni says, I've invested my life into this and my family has invested our savings. This is important for us and we believe in it. And you know what? If I am poor one day and if I'm out in the streets, well, so be it. But we did this and I'm proud of it and I'll never take anything back. When he looked in the water that day, he just didn't see a coat. He saw a cry for justice. I know most of us don't have millions to pour out into a justice cause. That's not God's call for everyone. But we are called to see those on the margins with eyes of mercy and hearts leaning into justice. It's part of the kit of being human. It's part of the heart that our Lord has redeemed and reshaped and transformed into his people that we see his world in the way that he sees his world. May God give you the heart for justice and mercy. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you so much for redeeming us and transforming us and shaping us in such a way that we just don't walk through this world with indifference. Lord, that we give up living because we really chase things that don't matter. Lord, you promise that as we come to you that you will shape our hearts. And you promise that you will forgive us of our indifference. And you promise that you'll set our feet on higher paths and you'll give our lives a higher purpose to do your work in the world. Lord God, you have called us to proclaim your gospel. Your gospel that sets us right with you as the cosmic act of justice in this world. And Lord, we know that our salvation is because of your mercy and because of your grace and love that, Lord, we're like poor beggars by a gate that we can't do anything to help ourselves. But you looked at us anyway and you helped us in Christ. So Lord, help us to take this sense of our help and our mercy from you into our world around us. And as we look upon others, Syrian refugees, those who are homeless, those who are being exploited in many ways, in the many different ways that people are being hurt and harmed, help us to look with eyes of mercy and let justice roll down like the waters from a mighty stream. And let it start with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we're going to close our service with another song. And um, after uh, our song today, um, I'm going to, to close us in prayer again with our benediction. But let me invite you, if you have a commitment that you would like to share, if you have a prayer request, um, I'll be glad to meet with you right down here uh, to my right, to your left, and just talk with you and pray with you about what God is doing uh, in your heart and in your life. Let's stand together as we sing.